Hello there, squirrel listeners. Chapter 2 of Bars and Boxcars. The sixth book in the Mitzi Moon Paranormal Series. Cozy Mystery Series. My attempts to catch up with Paulson are stymied by these blankety-blank hills on terrazzo flooring. It's more dangerous than trying to run on black ice. I came to know that slippery danger firsthand during my premier winter up north, and it did not end well for my backside. So I'm forced to slow my pace and preserve my dignity. Paulson gets whatever she came for and slips out the front door. I'm left with no clue about her visit and the unsavory option of pestering a sitting judge like the nosy Gladys Kravitz from Bewitched. Now might be a good time to mention that my happy place is film and television. Those lovely worlds that unfold before the eyes saved me from oblivion during my years in foster care. Of course, the after effect is that I tend to draw most of my real world comparisons from that utterly fictional universe. Come see, come saw. Like a laser targeting system, I keep my eyes trained on the tonsured head of Paulson's judge. If I lose him in this crowd of near clones, <laughs> I'll never find him again. Without breaking the visual lock, I scoop a tray of champagne flutes off the car bar and ig ignore the caterer's queries. I'm closing fast, three more strides, and Mitzi, I hope you're not planning on attempting what I hypothesize. Silas glides into my path like a ballroom dancer who plants his feet with the permanence of a mighty oak. He can be very sneaky. My fake smile fades, my shoulders droop, I, da I down a flute of bubbly from my own tray. This is your father's big night. You'll have a plethora of time to sleuth around the sheriff's station tomorrow. The caterer finally reaches up to me and unceremoniously reclaims his tray of stemware. Leaning towards Silas, I whisper into his preternaturally large ear. I got a message in my ring, train tracks. I'm worried Paulson is out to get my dad again. He nods as though he holds the wisdom and patience of the ages in either hand. And tomorrow you will unearth the meaning uh, beneath the message. He puts a hand on my arm and gently turns me toward the center of the room. For the time being, you have an anxious father who needs a calm presence at his side. Have I mentioned how much I hate it when Silas is right? Copy that, Mr. Willoughby. I turn my Vegas neon smile back on and catwalk across the lobby. Despite my good intentions, Amaryllis intercepts me before I can reach my paternal destination and steers me toward the alcove housing the roped-off elevator. The image immediately reminds me of Twiggy's no admittance sign blocking looky-loos <laughs> looky from the rare book loft back at my bookshop. Amaryllis leans in conspiratorially. Mitzi, I know we don't know each other all that well, but I have a little situation, and rumor has it you're a bit of an amateur detective. I nod too eagerly. I knew it. There's something going on with the trains, isn't there? She gazes up at me and her eyes widen with a mix of suspicion and shock. For the first time, I notice flecks of gold and green in her dark brown eyes. So the rumors are true, she murmurs. I hope she's referring to rumors about my sleuthing and not rumors about psychic powers. I chose I choose to go with a non-committal reply, I guess. You get the visions like Isadora? 
Jacob's always been cagey about it when I ask him, but Cal never stopped talking about how Isadora's uh, Isadora's visions were a boon and a curse. Does it drive you crazy? When do you get them? I wish I could formulate a response to staunch the word vomit that she's spewing at me, but I can't even manage to close my mouth. <laughs> Well, we don't have to talk about it right now, sweetie. She flutters her hand rapidly to indicate she's pushing the topic away. And she grins. I exhale the breath I didn't know I was holding. And successfully <laughs> close my gaping jaw. Maul. Maul. She continues to unfurl her request. Judge Peterson, no relation, just texted me. Sounds like Deputy Paulson interrupted the grand opening to get his signature on a search warrant for a line of boxcars on a, on a siding near Grand Falls. There's so much to unpack, I have to put up my hand to give myself a moment for silence. Any mention of Grand Files is bound to bring images <clears throat> of the green side green eyed sidewinder Rory Bombay to mind. So I have to process that. Then there's the search warrant being issued for a train that more than likely originated out of my father's Midwest Union Depot and finally amid <clears throat> no. And finally, the tidbit. That's, uh, yeah. About her last name being Peterson, which I don't think I actually knew. Where to begin? While I'm muddling that over, Amaryllis makes her ask, Can you pump your con contact at the sheriff's station for information? I'd sure like to know if they're gearing up for another assault on your father's good name. I try to listen, I honestly do, but as soon as she says sheriff station, I kind of get lost in one of my mind of movies. This one stars Sheriff Eric Harper, and it is not PG. Mitzi, are you having a vision right now? She leans toward me with a mix of concern and anticipation. Oops, I've drifted off for too long. Yes, what? Wait, I mean, no, I mean, I'll stop by the station first thing in the morning. She sort of nods and shakes her head at the same time. Would you mind giving a call right now? If Paulson was pushing for that warrant tonight, Amaryllis Peterson may stand a head short, shorter than me, but those dark eyes pack a wallet. Uh, I'm powerless to refuse. I'm on it. Thank you. I owe you one. She strides back into the party in her tailored DKNY skirt suit without a ba uh, backward glance. Torn between the need to please my dad's girlfriend and the need to not infuriate my mentor, I struggle for a full three seconds with my decision. Of course I'm going to call Eric. I'm honestly a little miffed he didn't turn up. Uh, a male deputy answers the phone and transfers me to the sheriff whom I asked for by his proper title and with the expected amount of decorum. Hey Eric, why is Deputy Paulson interrupting my dad's grand opening party to get a search warrant signed? To his credit, he doesn't even act surprised or inquire how I got my information, but he does attempt to sidestep my question with a boilerplate, boilerplate line about not discussing ongoing investigations. Before he can shut me down completely, I hit him with one tiny piece of, it, of knowledge. I possess. Are you out? Are you searching the depot too? Or are you only searching the boxcars? If you're going to try to implicate my dad in something, I think I deserve fair warning as a friend. The 
low whistle on the other end of the line brings a smile to my face. Apparently, I haven't lost all my mystery. However, the story that Eric unravels brings a fresh set of chills to my skin. I can hardly get off the call fast enough. Grabbing another glass of champagne to calm my nerves, <laughs> I fake smile my way through the sea of attendees in search of Amaryllis. All green eyes are on the podium as my father be begins his dedication speech. All eyes. I say all green eyes. All eyes. His voice is deep and steady, even though my extra senses are picking up on a strong undercurrent of nerves. I'm pleased to see such a wonderful turnout. The men and women of the Duncan Restorative Justice Foundation will be circulating all evening to answer any questions you may have about how you can support and utilize our services. Amaryllis leads a roundup of thunderous applause. I pause and listen for a moment. <clears throat> I don't want my dad to see me grab his girlfriend and start whispering frantically in her ear. I'll wait until his focus shifts. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Jacob pushes his palms toward the floor. In an attempt to quiet the praise as his cheeks burn flush. The real heroes tonight are the six former inmates who have chosen to commit to this program and be our guinea pigs. One of the ex-cons with a shaved head displaying a full cranial tattoo rubs his thick black beard and chuckles better than lab rats, I suppose. The other five chuckling, my father shakes his head. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Uh, public speaking isn't my thing. No matter what we call it, I'm grateful that you and your parole officers agreed to give this a fair shot. The guys nod. As Jacob turns to the truth on... <clears throat> on stage and announces the names of the men who will be the first test sub subjects for his job placement program. I ca casually sidle up next to Amaryllis. She takes one look at my face and gestures for me to follow her beyond the velvet ropes upstairs to a private office. When I walk into the room, the view of the stairs twinkling about stars Stairs. Stars twinkling above the vast Great Lake stretching out across the harbor behind the building takes my breath away. Amaryllis closes the door behind us, walks across the plush carpeting toward the larger picture windows, and slowly turns to face me. Her features pinch with concern. Is it bad? I swallow and nod. It's pretty bad, but I don't think it has anything to do with Jacob. As soon as she learns my father's not being investigated, her tense shoulders relax. Oh, uh, uh, dang it. He just went blind, y'all. Do 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 do. Beyond the belt ropes, up the man closes the door, walks across the plush carpeting. Is it bad? I swallow and nod. It's pretty bad, but I don't think it has anything to do. As soon as she hears my father's not being investigated, her tense shoulders relax. All right, give it to me straight. First, I'm obligated to say that this information doesn't leave this room. She nods. Goes without saying. The Penn Cherry Harbor Sheriff's Department is working with the FBI to investigate an interstate gang of train robbers. Her eyebrows arch comically. Train robbers? Like bandanas covering their face? Six shooters? Six shooters in the air train robbers? In the air train. Her hilarious pantomime of the hypothetical bandits makes me giggle. 
Breathless from the laughter, I blurt, I know, right? She regains control first and asks, seriously, Winter, what are you talking about? Eric says it's a very small, highly efficient gang. They sound less Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and more Ocean's Eleven. They've been working their way across the country, robbing train cars filled with IN electronics. Midwest Union is just their latest topic. They're called the Stopwatch <clears throat> Robbers because they never spend more than 15 minutes per heist. He said the only predictable pattern is that they hit each rail line three times before they move on, but at completely unpredictable intervals. The first hit on Midwest Union went down last night. The search warrant is to check the train. Depots employed records for new hires and to examine the rail cars on the sliding siding <laughs> for physical evidence. Eric claims they notified Dad's secretary. And Marillas drops her head like a rag doll, eventually looks at me and rolls her eyes. Hannah? Hannah is a barely is barely a warm body feeling the seat. I've told Jacob at least ten times to replace her. But she's a single mom with a young child, and he somehow feels she deserves an 11th chance. I smile, and my heart bubbles with the warmth. My dad, pretty. My dad's a pretty good guy. The fact that he was responsible for one of the largest big box store robberies in the history of Birch County is in the past. He served his time, paid his debt to society, and now he's paying it forward. By helping others. Eric says that there's no, sus no suspicion on dad, but they want to catch this gang before they move on. Thanks for making that phone call, Mitzi. I hope you don't think it was an abuse of our relationship. My eyes fill with confusion. Abuse? No way. I was looking for an excuse to snoop, and your request gave me just what I needed to disobey Silas. She laughs harder than I would have expected. That man can be downright menacing. He was my professor for tort, T-O-R-T, law, and even though it was more than a decade ago, the mere thought of drawing his displeased gaze during the lecture, still makes me break out in cold sweats. I join her laughter, but I'm a little distracted with this new play, new piece of Silas's history that she drops into my lap. I had no idea he was ever a professor. Wonders never cease. Amaryllis opens the front door and gestures and gestures for me to follow her. We better get back downstairs before we're missed. And that is all. Chapter 2. And all. Cut <laughs> my throat for tonight. Didn't goof up too much for it being 12.36 a.m. I need to go to bed. Love y'all. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Mwah. Those of you who are new to listening to my books, I got a whole bunch of them by playlist. And you don't have to listen, you know. You can go back and catch the first one of in this series, but you don't have to. But they're there. I should have put book one, book two, book three, and all that. Maybe I'll go back and do that on this series, but I got Little the Little Women series. Sorry for repeating for those of you who've heard it. Uh, the Little Women series, Little House on the Prairie, all kinds of stuff. So, if you ever want to just pick a playlist and let her rip, that's fine. Um, uh, you know, while you craft, if you want to. If you don't, I totally understand. 
It's not everybody's bag. I wish my voice were pleasant like Ola Joe's, but it is what it is. <laughs> I hate it when people say that. So cliche. Love you, Matches V Sweet. Don't be ugly. See, I hope to see you tomorrow. At three bells. Bye bye. Oh, it's today. Today at three bells. Easter. <laughs>